to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Daniel Murphy, and I'm assistant editor of the journal. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article in the current issue of the journal. Today's podcast features an interview with Keith Revell, Associate Professor of History at Florida International University. In the interview, Dr. Revell and I discuss his article titled, The Rise and Fall of Copa City, 1944-1957, Nightclubs and the Evolution of Miami Beach, that recently appeared in the spring 2017 issue of the FHQ. Please introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your academic background. My name is Keith Revel. I received my master's degree and my PhD in American history from the University of Virginia. Graduated there in 1994 and in 1996 took a job in the public administration program here at Florida International University where I have been teaching uh, in the undergraduate and graduate program leadership, public policy, and urban development. And uh, my research during that time has focused mainly on the work that I started at the University of Virginia. Uh, My first book was entitled Building Gotham, Public Policy and Civic Culture in New York City, 1898 to 1938. And that was on uh, the development of various institutions of planning in that city in the late 19th and early 20th century. And I've done uh, a fair amount of work on uh, the 1916 zoning ordinance. So I had some background in urban development, and that's what brought me to FIU. And during that time, specifically in 1999, uh, one of my colleagues suggested that I take a look at what was going on in South Beach, which by that time was in full bloom the revival that had begun in the mid-1980s. It come to its fruition in the mid-1990s, and it was by that time not the urban disaster area that it had been in the 1970s and early 1980s, but instead was the city's leading source of tourism. And over the years, I have Uh, dabbled in the study of what was going on on South Beach, uh, focusing uh, mainly on the Art Deco revival. And in that process, I became associated with uh, some of the folks who have been pushing that revival, the Miami Design Preservation League. Uh, And they were kind enough to invite me to give one of their centennial lectures on the development of Miami Beach. And they asked me to handle the decade from 1975 to 1985, since I had been studying the origin of the Art Deco revival. So in October of 2015, I gave a lecture on that time period. Uh, And being a historian, I was drawn further and further back in time to try to understand the origin of that Art Deco revival. And as part of that presentation, I came across the stories of Miami Beach nightclubs. And I knew about the nightclubs that were part of the Art Deco revival, those discotheque type of nightclubs that uh, were there in the mid-80s and 90s. But I had not been aware that there were nightclubs, uh, very famous nightclubs, from the 40s and 50s. And in that lecture, I came to understand that by the mid-1950s, those nightclubs had disappeared. So this idea of what happened to these nightclubs intrigued me, and that's what led me uh, to the research behind the uh, Copa City article that uh, that I am going to publish here in uh, the Florida Historical Quarterly. Okay, that, that makes complete sense. You're certainly the expert to do this then, and um, when I was reading your article, I mean, I, I, I learned a lot, but just in general, can you just briefly tell us what was Copa City? For a very brief time, Copa City was the world's greatest nightclub. Uh, Copa City was a nightclub that uh, was founded by a guy named Murray Winger, a New Yorker who had uh, bounced around in various businesses until he established two nightclubs in Coney Island in the in the uh, early 1940s, and in 1944 decided to to try his hand at a nightclub on Miami Beach. 
So he came with a partner and uh, purchased a nightclub called the Monte Carlo. He rechristened it as the Copacabana. And from 1945, slightly before the end of the war, until June of 1948, uh, the Copacabana became one of the most important uh, nightclubs on Miami Beach. Uh, and there was quite a Miami Beach nightclub scene. It was started in a small way in the 1920s, really developed in the late 1930s, uh, was quiet during the war, but in the immediate post-war period, there was a real explosion of nightclubs. There were uh, over a dozen nightclubs in two key entertainment districts in the South Beach area. And the Copacabana and its arch rival uh, called the Beachcomber, which was right across the street, uh, were uh, world-class centers of entertainment. These were places where during the high season, and that would be from December until April, uh, the most famous entertainers in the United States uh, came to give nightly performances to tourists who flocked here because of the nightlife. So Frank Sinatra, Maurice Chevalier, Sophie Tucker, Milton Berle, a whole host of other folks who would uh, have uh, roles in film and TV uh, very famous nightclub talent uh, flocked here. And for those four, four and a half months, uh, Miami Beach was a leading center of nighttime entertainment in the United States, certainly on par with New York and Hollywood. So right up there at the top of the entertainment ladder. In June of 1948, because of this intense rivalry among the clubs for talent and for customers, the Copacabana uh, burned. Uh, perhaps arson, there were other fires in nightclubs, and it was, uh, in, in one case, in the case of the Beachcomber, uh, it, it was concluded that there was an arsonist fire. So this intense competition makes it look as though uh, club owners are turning to fire, uh, in order to get rid of their rivals because there's this intense competition among the clubs. Well, Winger, who's in New York buying talent for that year, comes back. There's this uh, great public outpouring over the uh, demise of this club. And Winger, who's always ambitious, got these big plans for the future, w wants to wants to become the king of the hill in the Miami Beach nightclub scene and can't quite do it. He's standing there being interviewed on the steps of his burned-out club, and he says, uh, what, what, what I'd really like is to get a man like Norman Bel Geddes to come down here and redesign my club. Well, Norman Bel Geddes was one of the nation's leading industrial and set designers, known for his um, uh, streamlining aesthetic, uh, and, and in a sense, he almost single-handedly developed the, uh, the the aesthetic of streamlining. Uh, he had been he had tried his hand at designing almost everything: um, um, restaurants. He helped redesign the uh, uh, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. He he did uh, set design on Broadway. He did store windows. So here's a guy who. Uh, really understands how aesthetics and practical operation of, of buildings and structures and businesses, uh, how those two things can go together. Well, apparently Winger had researched him, knew of him, and makes this statement on the steps of his burnout building, uh, and Bel Geddes gets wind of it because Bel Geddes is interested in many things, but especially publicity for himself. So that he and Winger then get together and in four months uh, come up with this brilliant new design, um, a, a nightclub design to end all nightclubs as they see it. Uh, and in December of 1948, so just a few months after the club burns, uh, Copa City, the world's greatest nightclub, opens for business. And of course, it has an incredible opening night with Milton Berle and a uh, large cast, showgirls, other supporting acts. And so for a 
handful of months during that season, it looks like Copa City, this magnificent curved building where uh, there are no interior columns so that it creates this vast, vast sense of space, unlike any nightclub in Miami Beach or really any nightclub in the world, this wonderful performance space, uh, extraordinary modern technology, advanced lighting. It has shops in it made of where the walls are made of curved glass that all hang from the ceiling. This dazzling space is sort of the jewel in the crown of Miami Beach nightclub. The problem is that it's extraordinarily expensive, and that only compounds the difficulties that Murray Winger faced as a nightclub operator, as all nightclub operators faced, which is they are in a talent war, that they have to pay for extraordinarily high-priced talent, and because of the competition among the clubs, they're always bidding up the price of the talent. So Winger is among the biggest players in this, and he's paying, in some cases, uh, performers fifteen or $20,000 a week. Well, given that overhead, given the extraordinary expense of the club, uh, he, uh, he, he, he outspends himself. And so even though he's making great money, um, industrialists, politicians, rich folk, even though all of those people are coming to his club and he's doing very well, he has such enormous debt, debts and costs that uh, he goes bankrupt in April. So for this short four-month period in the 1948-49 season, Copa City, the world's greatest nightclub, works and works brilliantly, but it is so saddled by debts and expenses that Winger goes bankrupt in April and loses the club. So the short answer to your question is it was the world's greatest nightclub for about four months. <laughs> that's, that's, it's a great story. I mean, the, the way you, you tell it, it's almost a, you would expect to see it come out of Hollywood. But but the other thing that kind of strikes me about it is it seems like, to me, not not knowing the, the, the subject like you do, is, is Copa City like a, a representation, a microcosm of – entertainment and tourism in Florida during the 20th century, or at least that part of the 20th century, or is it kind of an, an aberration? Is it, is it the norm, or is it, is it something else? One of the things I discovered in this research is just how central nightclubs were to Miami Beach's reputation. And of course, Miami and Miami Beach during this period are the state's leading tourist attraction. They are by no means the only one and they don't necessarily serve a working class or a broad middle class uh, tourist market. Uh, remember, during this time, Miami Beach doesn't have roadside amusements. It doesn't have theme parks. In fact, for most of its history, it doesn't. That's not the draw of Miami Beach. Uh, neither uh, during this period uh, does it have the giant hotels which will make it famous or increasingly famous uh, in the late 1940s and mid-1950s? The leading example being the Fountain Blue Hotel, which is a product of the mid-1950s. Instead, the tourist economy there is based in uh, much smaller hotels, hotels mainly built during the 1930s, uh, they don't have large entertainment spaces. Most of them don't have uh, restaurants or shops. I instead, they uh, are involved almost exclusively in lodging. So when tourists come to Miami Beach, they're going to spend the night at the hotel, but they are going to enjoy the city, mainly South Beach at this time, where there's going to be uh, bars, shops, restaurants, and nightclubs. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I try to convey in that article is just how important this uh, tourist ecology, this collection of nightclubs that create nighttime entertainment, how important they were for Miami Beach's image. Um, and the Copa City survives. There's a, 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 a saga of how uh, Winger... Um, uh, recaptures the club, loses it in bankruptcy, comes back and manages it again uh, 
four or five times between uh, April of 1949 and his tragic and untimely death in uh, 1957. He was only 40 years old. Uh, but it's during that time that this ecology of nighttime entertainment in Miami Beach, which flourished from the late 1930s until really the late 1940s, that that uh, unique uh, combination of a seaside tropical resort and this dense urban collection of nightclubs, restaurants, and bars reminiscent of some place like Manhattan, that that combination sustains Miami Beach's glamorous image. However, by the late 1940s, there's a new breed of hotel. And in fact, the first ones to enter, enter the new market of hotels, uh, we don't even remember their names, the Casablanca, the Saxony, the San Susi. These were hotels that uh, were built by uh, very ambitious um, hoteliers who understood that uh, the glamour of Miami Beach was that nightlife, and they wanted to enclose it. They wanted to bring it into the hotel. So whereas most of the hotels from the 1930s were too small to have entertainment spaces, those built in the late 1940s and into the 1950s were much bigger, and they were designed with nightclubs inside them, nightclubs, restaurants, bars, shops, in addition to the fact that they were almost always built along the beach, which meant that they had uh, ocean access and increasingly uh, pools and cabanas. So these larger hotels then enclose these entertainment spaces, increasing competition for talent, uh, and this thriving ecology of nighttime entertainment, which was really characteristic, which made Miami Beach that glamorous destination re resort in the 1930s and especially the uh, period right after the war, that, that time when Winger is really getting into the business and making his name, that, that ecology erodes. Uh, and Copa City, uh, along with the other big independent nightclubs, those not associated with a hotel, uh, those disappear. And in fact, by uh, the mid-1950s, uh, there are only three regular nightclubs, independent nightclubs on Miami Beach. At Copa City, which is going to close within a couple of years, the uh, Palm Island Club, which becomes the Latin Quarter, and the Beachcomber. Uh, but by the late 1950s, all of those have closed. And nighttime entertainment has moved into hotels. So insofar as Copa City represented uh, something larger, it did so for a very short period of time. And that's what I found so striking about the history here, that uh, Miami Beach's image was sustained by these independent nightclubs. It made Miami Beach a center of glamour uh, and a national capital of nighttime entertainment. But it did so for a very short period of time. And of course, this is one of the main themes of Florida history, how rapidly things change in the 20th century, especially in the years after 1940. So whereas you can say 1946, 1947, 1948, it really looks, given the importance of Miami Beach and given the importance of nighttime entertainment, that it looks as though that, that sort of scene, that glamorous nightlife scene, is really the heart and soul of tourism in Miami Beach. But by the time you get to the mid-1950s, that has changed. There is glamour, but it's enclosed in hotels. And those spaces that were associated with glamorous nightlife, those have disappeared. And of course, that then prompts other changes. Buildings that are no longer being used as nightclubs or restaurants or bars to attract tourists are then turned over to local residential uses. And so you see a transformation of the city from tourism to 
retirement to uh, people using Miami Beach in effect as a suburb of Miami rather than being on the west side, close to the Everglades, it's on the east side. Uh, so Miami Beach's image gradually begins to change because that nightlife has disappeared and all of those buildings are turned over to other uses. So is it a microcosm? Well, if so, it's a microcosm very briefly. Its star burns uh, very bright, but for only a short time. And, uh, and I think this is one of the reasons that I found it so interesting, uh, the decline of nightlife foreshadows the decline of Miami Beach in the years after 1950, so that by the time we get to the 1960s, the city is the, the city star is really fading. It is rapidly becoming a retirement city, not a glamorous destination resort. By the 1970s, uh, it's really in a desperate position. And after the Mariel boat lift of 1980, uh, it's really seen as uh, uh, not, a, not a tourist destination uh, very much at all, that instead it, it becomes a poster child for urban decay in what once was a resort area. Now, of course, the interesting part of the story, which I don't go into in the article, but which I'm working on in subsequent research, is the fact that the revival of Miami Beach's tourist industry is centered in South Beach. It's not revived by bigger hotels up the beach. Instead, those places that were glamorous and exciting in the 1940s become the source of the energy, the excitement of the Art Deco revival, which includes nightlife. So there's a larger story to be told here, uh, and uh, in order to understand it, I think it's important that we go back and see how at one point in the 30s and the 40s, uh, Miami Beach was both a tropical paradise and an urban entertainment paradise. There's so much there. I mean, uh, one of the, the beauties of your piece is that you touch on so many different types of history from to entertainment history, tourism history, architectural history in, in Florida. It's, it's There's a lot here, but... And, and you kind of have already touched on this, and I don't, wanna, I don't want you to give away any of your conclusions for your future research, but, but just, just looking forward, so charting this forward to today, the 20, early 21st century, is, are there legacies, like direct legacies of the Copa City experience uh, to Miami Beach today? Is it remembered in Miami Beach? What, 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 is, its, uh, what is its meanings? What's, what's its meanings both to, I guess, locals and to just general um, – uh, people that are generally interested in um, the development of Miami Beach and its his, its recent history. On occasion, I will read something, a local community interest story, in which someone will mention one of the old nightclubs, referring to the glamour of the old days. The problem is that those are oftentimes based on very limited information, and that was one of the things that I struggled with writing this article, that piecing together all the necessary information, that there was a scrap here and a scrap there. And uh, I think that's reflective of the memory of those clubs, which is to say that given their importance, one would think that they would have left more of certainly an archival footprint, but an urban footprint that there would be something of them that people would remember because it's there, it can be seen. I, I was frankly shocked by how ephemeral that truly important period in the city's uh, history, which was had such an impact on the city's image, how ephemeral that was, especially in terms of its uh, lasting impact on the urban um, fabric. Uh, Copa City, that building, is still there. It has been transformed, it's been transformed into several things. It's uh, currently a self-storage facility. You can see the curved outline of the building, but there's no historical marker. There's nothing to indicate that that was ever uh, the world's greatest nightclub. In almost every other case, 
those buildings have entirely disappeared. In, in, in a couple of cases, in one, uh, one of the more famous clubs called Bill Jordan's Bar of Music, it's a vacant lot. The building isn't there at all. Um, one of the most famous buildings in the revival of South Beach was called Friedman's Bakery. It was the one that was first, one of the first ones to be painted those pastel colors and appear on the cover of an architectural magazine. That, as it turns out, had been a very famous nightclub earlier on. So in some ways, the Art Deco revival, which has highlighted the significance of the buildings of the 1930s, has missed uh, this part of Miami Beach's history, which is people were coming and staying in those Art Deco buildings, but what were they doing? I can tell you they weren't only going to the beach. They attracted so many people because there were nightclubs, bars, and restaurants that made South Beach in particular this rich urban environment. So the ephemerality of this crucial moment uh, has meant that uh, – nightclubs are really uh, not understood uh, and little remembered in terms of uh, the development of the city. Uh, now, I would say, however, that the reason that South Beach thrived back then was that even the biggest of the nightclubs couldn't contain very much of the entertainment market, which is to say Copa City, which was ultimately the largest of the nightclubs, at best could seat maybe 800 people. That was just a fraction of the folks who were out enjoying nightclubs on any given night. So one of the characteristics of South Beach uh, that accounted for the vitality of the nightlife market then, and which I would hypothesize accounts for the vitality of the Art Deco revival, is that none of those buildings are big enough to capture all the economic activity that's going on there. You go further up the beach, up the beach with the big hotels, they are designed to enclose and to capture as much economic activity as possible. One of the leading nightclub owners, a guy named Danny Davis, who was the impresario behind a club that was located very near the Copa City called Kitty Davis's Airliner. And its theme was that you felt like you were inside an aircraft in the air when you were at Kitty Davis's Airliner. Danny Davis's argument against the legal changes that allowed hotels to have nightclubs was that the hotels themselves were trying to enclose the city. They were enclosing restaurants, they were enclosing bars, they were enclosing shops, they were enclosing nightclubs. And what that meant is that the independent nightclubs, uh, which created this thriving ecology of, of, of multiple restaurants, multiple bars, multiple nightclubs, and made South Beach a vital urban area, that they were going to lose out. And that's exactly what happened. That um, Murray Winger, in addition to being a gambler and spending too much money on talent, uh, was also undermined by the fact that these larger hotels uh, enclose the city, capture as many of the tourist dollars as they can, and therefore that tourist ecology of all those people out in all those places enjoying the streets, moving from bar to bar and from club to club, that that no longer happens. So I think that insofar as there is a lesson not yet learned, still implicit in the urban landscape, it's that a thriving urban area works because there are so many different businesses, none of which are able to monopolize or enclose very much of that economic activity. And that means there is a constant movement of uh, tourist and tourist dollars and leisure dollars among a wide variety of businesses, uh, and that sustains a lively urban environment. Well, like I said, so much here, um, and, and you've covered a great deal, but is there anything else you would like our audience to know about um, this article or, or your research in general? I would like them to support their local archives. 
as a historian, you can only rely so much on newspapers. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that's, that's easier now. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's easier now than it used to be because there are an increasing number of them that are digitized, allow keyword searches. The richness of history, one of the, one of the richness, uh, one of the elements of the richness of history uh, is uh, archival sources. Uh, and supporting archives, providing material to archives, encouraging people to provide material to archives so that historians can have the raw materials that allow us to construct a complex, persuasive uh, a story that allows some understanding about these, these ephemeral, but nonetheless crucial processes and issues and elements of our history, uh, that, that that's a much easier process when we have excellent archival sources. Um, and I had a few <laughs> for writing this article, um, but I wish I had more. And one of the very surprising things about doing the research uh, was that uh, given the importance of these uh, nightclubs uh, as urban and um, economic institutions, how little of them remains. And in fact, some of the sources that I ultimately um, uh, used were in, in private hands. Uh, and so I would, I would encourage everyone to support their local archives, uh, that even though uh, uh, material may seem unimportant at the moment, over the long term, it may um, be just the material we need in order to understand the past. Uh, that is a great reminder. We cannot say that um, often enough. I mean, I completely agree with you. Everyone out there, support your local archives. Uh, Professor Ravel, I really, we've learned a lot today. I really appreciate you talking to us, and uh, good luck with your future research. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in the state of Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you will consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly Podcast. If you enjoy listening to this interview and know of others who enjoy history, please tell them about the podcast and have them find us on Facebook.